making the most of your existing assets. This is our third sort of delve into this sort of webinar um, scene. I'm, I'm trying to get some information across from what we see every day, how we're working with stuff. So I, I'm aiming here to sort of simplify the process that we use when dealing with uh, uh, pollution containment, especially environmental on the drainage. Hopefully there's some sort of um, information we put across today that you'll be able to use. Please, as I said before I start, is if you've got anything or you need to speak to me one-to-one -one or get in touch with us, you know, please do. Uh, uh, we're always there trying to help. It's a it's a challenge of ours. We we actually make our business from selling, obviously, the, the containment valves, the toggle block systems and working for companies. But we also want to help other people sort of follow and pick up the guidance and actually follow the same process because it, it, it will protect the environment. So I've done this before. Um, already sort of know who I am a little bit of an introduction to me um, my name's David Cole um, I served my apprenticeship with Ford Motor Company in a in a in a place called Leamington Spa in Warwickshire in England and I worked there for 24 years believe it or not um, uh, and whilst there obviously I was involved in dealing with pollution incidents and spills and breakdowns of machinery significant spills we used to have uh, and at that time I came up with a product called Envirovalve which in 1998 was my sort of I'm going to make yourself a millions uh, but what I sort of worked out was that I could control drainage very quickly. And if I control drainage and isolate flow where I wanted it to be stopped, I could then uh, remove the spillage without using spill products. So I wasn't actually using any that then went to landfill. I could send that back for recycling. It's quite a good idea. It's taken 20 odd years to actually get it to the point where now that businesses now do this as a standard thing. Um, Drain block is one of our portable pieces of equipment. So it's something that the UK Fire Service uh, use, the Environment Agency a version of that and supplied to the fire brigade in the UK. It's used for blocking drains quickly where there isn't any protection in place. Uh, APA, which is the fuel industry in the UK's um, sort of um, um, lobby group. Uh, and so we've won an award with one of our valve designs there. And I suppose for me, the biggest point, a turning point for me and why I'm here today really is I was asked by the EA to sit on the writing of Syria 736 in 2012. This was as a result of the Bunsfield fire where we we didn't have any real understanding of what would happen if certain things happened. And that, to me, was sort of like a, a turning point. Um, so from that event, what we did is we wrote this new guidance. I was heavily involved with it. I acted as one of the launch speakers on the actual launch day. And, and since that time, I've carried on trying to educate different um, businesses from consultants to, to manufacturing companies about using the guidance because it's a really uh, interesting sort of guidance to pick up. It's free. So anybody can get it anywhere around the world. You can download it by the british taxpayer so it's there to help it's not there to be a hindrance despite what people think it's there to help so a little bit now of, of what we're doing so one of the things that i do on i use linkedin a lot and I, I i i try to put stories on linkedin all the time about what we're doing and things around pollution events all around the world that's happening whether it's plastic whether it's chemical spills whether it's fire um so it's something that's come about more and more and people get involved and send me replies back and there's always a little bit of a industrial side of things saying, oh, the, the regulator is just asking for things that can't be done. They're causing a problem. They're, they're asking too much of us. You know, we've got businesses to run. But this is really key. So I've put like four points together. So why does the regulator want me to evidence risk of water pollution? What they're really getting at, if we go right back to what happened at Bunsfield, was an event happened, a disaster happened, and the site itself had no clear plan of how it would stop that entering the environment. By entering the environment, we lost um, water abstraction legacy that's lost the British taxpayer forever so nobody can really add up what that's worth so that's why the regulator is asking this question and they're asking it more and more they'll be driving it more and more what they're asking people to do is can you evidence that what you've done or what you know is at least going to give us a level of protection if something goes wrong on your site why does the regulator keep referring to this Syria 736 C736 it's because it's kind of what the only thing they've really got because in 2015 PGs. Some of you might know the pollution prevention guidelines. You still might use them today because they're really useful guidance notes. Um, but these were kind of archived. Um, this was mainly due to cuts and a decision made by the UK government that, that the regulator had to become a regulator and not really offer um, guidance anymore. So where you've got this Syria 736, this is an industrial um, document that's funded by the British taxpayer, supported by the EA. So it kind of makes it a guidance that they can use and say to people, can you please please refer to that that's what we want you to follow so that's why they're doing it they're doing it really because as a regulator 
their problem is you mustn't pollute. If you pollute, we're going to prosecute you. They're trying to be helpful, which some people think is actually they're not being helpful, but they're trying to be helpful by directing you as, as end users or designers, whatever it is, to look at this guidance because this is this is kind of saying what they see as a problem and it's giving some answers in design of how they want you to approach um, pollution management. Um, that's nothing more. Um, recently on a, a, some feedback from uh, from LinkedIn to one of my colleagues who put something on about spill mapping, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, the regulator has been awkward and this is pointless because what they're saying is the regulator is just give, making more work for them. I hope today that what I'm going to talk about today changes that attitude because it isn't pointless it's very simple to do and if you take the right approach no matter what you've got even if you've got no money to spend at all you can actually be prepared the regulator really is trying to get us to do they want us to be interested in stopping pollution whether it's plastic pollution whether it's chemical pollution whether it's a pollution from a firewater runoff or just general activity they're trying to get people to start to take responsibility for what their problem is there's, there's, there is no excuse and I think the British taxpayers, certainly taxpayers around the world, probably would say, well, why are we paying for other people's mistakes? Um, another one that comes in, we can't afford to complete a risk model of our payment isn't viable. I don't think you can ever say that until you've actually done uh, and completed some sort of risk model. And that might mean just purely getting somebody in who knows about pollution, somebody like ourselves, who would actually give you some evidence and give you some sort of feedback. When we go to sites, we often see that, you know, we can't do anything about it, but there'll be decanting chemicals over the top of a storm drain. Very simply is don't decant chemicals over the top of a storm drain or seal that storm drain off. Fit a valve, some sort of buffer to control it if something happens. It's not exactly impossible. It's not. It certainly can't be said that it's not viable. It's simple to see. And it's quite astonishing at some levels that people don't actually notice the very basics the very simple point that, well, if I'm actually doing something that I'm unloading my fuel oil and filling my tank and I'm doing it in the street, there is a potential if that tank or if that fuel line breaks, it's going to go straight down the drain and cause a pollution incident. What is the of that pollution incident? What people are finding is those consequences are high. You will get prosecuted. You may have to completely pay for the whole remediation cost. So that's why you need to understand and take this a little bit more seriously. It's not the regulator being awkward. It's a requirement. It's something that we have to do. So just a, a, another screen. These are the companies that we sort of work with. I think I could say that these have been really supportive companies that we've worked with. So we've gone in them. They've often had um, an historical attitude management. I think if I say the highways England, they fit penstock valves on virtually every major highway link. Not quite sure how anybody could say to me how they'd ever be really operated properly. I think there's a problem because there's no automation on most of them. So how would you actually get to a valve when you've got an RTA accident? We've worked recently for uh, Jaguar Land Rover. We've done some projects with Whirlpool, looking at their drainage and standard drainage. Muller, Muller as, um, as a dairy site, so we look at how we control milk spills, etc. And Biffer and DHL on waste. And um, so all of these sites really are people we've worked with. So, OK, let's get going on to what I really want to get into. So the key key reference documents, these are the documents that have anything that I do today. I really want you to pick it up and reading. So Syria 736, I want you to read it. I really want people to download it. I want them to read it. To be fair, if you read the first four or five sections, you, you'll have got the risk element that I'm really on about. The other elements, though, useful to me, more for towards the, the construction and the design side of things purely a site and you just want to understand really about well how do i understand what my pollution risk is it's just the first few pages really the first few sections sorry about 20 30 pages get into it and read it sentencing guidelines i've stuck this in there because these are the driver so any business these are the driver because they don't want to have to pay the fines they don't want to have to be taken to court and prosecuted and potentially then lose um, other customers that might come to them because once you've been prosecuted you've committed a criminal offense i know as a business we're quite often asked supplier forms and one of those questions is have you been prosecuted for a hse incident or an environmental incident if you have there's a chance that that company won't be able to sign you on as a supplier so i've put that in there because i think people should be aware of it because it's really important because it's the game changer um and fire prevention plans this is something that the ea did bring out so it is a guidance note they brought out in 2016 it refers you straight back to syria 736 so it's deliberately there to ask you to look at it they brought it doing very well with managing firewater runoff um 
and they're trying to they're trying to push people without giving guidance because obviously that's what the uk government doesn't want them to do but it allows them to actually put something out where there is a real problem so getting started okay so if you're actually looking at your assets that you've got before you do anything i, th I think you need to be downloading this guidance and then just reading what the guidance is all about. So you could be small site, big site, it doesn't matter. Take the same approach. So as you see, you've probably only got to read sort of 20 pages. So I've put here that Syria 736, section 433 and section 388. 433 is basically a little caption I've pulled out of that page. And what that's asking you to look at, not necessarily control, but understand, is what would your site do if you had a fire? So you had a total fire, you're now losing materials, You've now got the fire, fire brigade on site. So this could be uh, a Tesco supermarket. It doesn't have to be some chemical plant. Just look at it type of business. You've got a fire. The fire brigade are there. So they're chucking water at it because they're trying to put it out. You've got a duration of 24 hours they're asking you to look at. You've also then got to think about if it rains, a one in 10 year uh, rain some of it, which is put into the guidance. And luckily in the guidance, they even give you the figures to work to. So you don't have to employ an expert. You can actually take this information and actually create your own volumes of water. Uh, I often use a, another reference point is Magic Maps, which allows me to take surface area of sites. And you can really use that to actually sort of risk. That'll start to give you volumes of water and might start to open your eyes to realize, well, actually, we could cause a pollution incident. So how do we then go about controlling it? Um, these are the stuff you, I've got here is one is 10 years site accuracy. So then what we look at from this is the only way forward with this on this asset. If you look at it, if you want to do it in full and this isn't something that's overcomplicated and something that's over expensive to do, you need a site accurate topography. So you need to know how the, la the layer and you need to know up to date drainage plans. I don't know if anybody's had any EA visits or regulator visits, SEPA, um, National Resource Wales. But one of the things they like to see is, can you give us some up-to-date drainage plans? These doesn't really need to be a scrap of paper. It should really be an accurate drawing of your drainage to show where your drains go. What they want to know is, where does it leave site? Because that is your initial pathway. So if you're looking at your asset and you're saying, right, I need to be able to stop a pollution event, a delivery event, a thousand litres of a cube from an IBC. You need to be saying, well, where's the drainage go? Can I fit an isolation valve, it's probably a toggle block because it's something that isolates the drain. Again, I reiterate, don't use the word pen stop valve because the EA will pick you up because that is a flow control device. You've got to make sure that the pen stop valve you use is actually a pollution containment device. It needs to stop the flow. It needs to be off grid so it can't be connected to the mains power because it's a good chance you'll have a pollution incident when you've actually got a power cut, power failure. It needs to be able to work quickly. So I'd say... 10 seconds from the point you activate it to the point it's actually isolated to flow. But that gives you the drainage channel. So then when you look at the site topography, what you're looking then at is what does it look like above ground? So I'm starting to flood the site. Evidence the design works. You need to know your site works. That is section 3.8. It's worth reading in the guidance. It's only a small paragraph. What they're saying to you is, is don't say I've fitted an isolation valve and you've got a 20 year old penstock at the end of the site. You need to be evidencing it to screw fix and you can buy some drainage dye you can put a hose pipe on a valve close it and see whether the dye comes through it if the dye comes through it it's not working that's your evidence that you need to then escalate and think about what you've done it may be the wrong valve it may be the valve needs some repairs quite often with um, any valves we put in the benching needs to be maintained you need to keep looking at it and checking it but this is what they're asking this is what the regulator is expecting not to spend thousands of pounds they're asking you just to if you've got something works evidence that if i shut that drainage network off i'm not going to pollute outside and try and evidence how long you've got before you need a drainage contractor on site sucking out your drains or sucking out your your, your above ground um, containment so what i've got here is this is a typical topography of a site that i'm going to talk about later but this is typical so what we do is we're looking at spot points you can see here if you see here this is the entrance into the site here's the building here's the main echo drainage and these the perimeter site you see what there's no actual um, boundary there. It's, there's nothing there at the moment. But what we've done is we've taken the topography of the total site. What we're looking at it then is what we're going to build up is in this risk assessment is that's the asset they've got. That is what it is. Can it be, can it be easily um, um, built up? Can it be easily made so that we can actually contain more water? The, this site here on here is now the drainage. So this is another site. So we need accurate drainage plans. This is a site that we did probably two or three years 
this is the drainage site so you can see the red that's the internal drainage within the site i'm not too worried really about that we've got a foul sewer we've got the storm drain i'm really interested in the storm drain the foul sewer has got a maximum flow rate potentially that could be used actually to allow firewater discharge if we don't discharge above what uh, is allowable at the time of the event so these these this understanding this asset is really important because these can actually be the pathways that we allow pollution out getting some good images of the drainage here is we did we fill in drainage cards which is not something that you know anybody can do lifting the manhole measuring the pipe work measuring the depth measuring what the chamber is because that potentially becomes a catchment volume so you can see there you know that 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 gully um manhole we've got there could probably easily contain if isolated a thousand cubes of, of a chemical so it allows us to develop what we're actually looking for it might just be that we want localized control so the assets already there all we need to be looking at is how can we ice turn that into a, a, a temporary tertiary uh, catchment point now something that's really really important important and something that a lot of people or businesses kind of have difficulty with is getting a good fire environmental impact ass assessment now this one here is is, a, is one that a, a colleague of mine does david hanlon I'll, I'll shout his name because he's a really good guy really useful contact to have now what he does is he will produce a sedoy field produce a different assessment for different sites here is he's done one for dhl uh it's a coma site so he's actually obviously quite a, a lengthy document but you can see the, the image here that's a fire that's what he's looking at if that place goes up and turns into the fire how do i contain that materials on site so we don't cause an impact to the environment when we do these documents which is sometimes really valuable by using somebody who's got fire experience and he's obviously an ex-fire officer but also with environmental knowledge and impact actually calculate and work out what sort of material is going to be thrown on that fire and what that volume is if that volume is calculated incorrectly you can actually be building buns or building tertiary containment well in excess of what's really required or possibly not big enough it's a really good investment something that everybody should do again all that david's doing here or this assessment he's doing is actually looking at what is already there and what is needed to be done to probably improve it, it it's assets that are already there if your if your factory is stuck in the middle of a triple si location you've got to put more effort into it because the impact potentially from a fine is going to be far greater so I've got three case studies because I said I wanted to do them short because I knew that when I ran this, it's just dragging on. Anybody can ring me up and have a chat with me about different projects. Or if you want to arrange a one to one meeting, please do. So I'm just going to start with Kellogg's. We've done it before. But the reason I've done it, I've, I brought it in again is because it, it's a really useful one and one that we've done and completed. So this site, again, was under pressure from the EEA to protect the local waterways due to the close proximity of an effluent treatment plant. That's that's the situation that sites in. So the challenge, the site had begun the process to build a bund to 110%. And this needed to stop because what they were going to do was they were going to create a bund around a, a different treatment plant they wouldn't be able to drive into. They were going to create a confined space. They were looking at over two metre high bunded walls. It wasn't possible. I think the costs were in excess of half a million pounds. I think the, the business itself was saying it's not viable. What do we do? I think by luck, we we brought them into Syria 70 to introduce them to it because they hadn't been introduced to it, which you'd like to think that any architect or designer would have introduced them to it when they asked the challenge initially. But the evidence of the business using Syria 7 to understand the total risk, that was our that was our challenge to actually understand what the problem was and then design a solution, trying to use what we've got. Basically the model, if any of you seen my um, webinar before, this is the model that runs. This is what happens. What you've got here is where I place that. It was decided that there was a hole in this in this um, in this um, balance tank, so that hole actually then would um, leak out 450 hole. What you see here is from topography, from drainage. Obviously, the drainage is isolated. We're looking at the drainage obviously it's a bit above ground flow path. This is how that that liquid would shoot out of this site if no protection was done at the moment. This was their problem. This was obviously to evidence to to, to the, the business um, that they needed to do something because literally the water is spreading everywhere. It's, it's uncontrolled. We've got various breaches and pollution, but it's mainly into the canal that's the main problem. So this gave the, um, the engineering uh, department something to present to their um, management. So the solution, 
to spill model the actual risk based on the extreme events, which you've just seen. Design a solution, use features. So what we're saying here is we have an effluent, we have an effluent treatment discharge. So that gives us a maximum rate that we can discharge at. A lot of this material on this site could be discharged through that. There was no problem, no issue with the water company. Drastically reduce the funding. That was really our, our aim was to actually stop building a, a brand new structure when it didn't need to be done. We're going to use what's there and to a a a achieve a design within a, a reasonable budget. So what you've got here now is this is the contained design. If you've seen this uh, before, I apologize. But it's what you're using here is we're using the car park. We're using an area that's not really used. It's not deep water. This is just uh, overspills. Using what's already there to contain the flow. What you've got here is, if I could get my arrow to work, just here, they've got to put some um, uh, improved curbing in. Not not high 300 mil curbing. It's just standard uh, 110 curbing. That's all they've got to do to create just a, a backwash so it pushes the water back into this area here. And what you can see here, here is, again, just a raised point. So for really what they were looking at here, what they were intending to do was just raise, raise the ground so the water is pushed back into this area. You're using the existing asset. The, the bund actually where the wall is, the bund wall here, is now only um, 0.7 of a metre high. So you haven't got any of the costs. You're uh, blocking the drainage. Obviously, the surface water drainage in this area is isolated. They've used a toggle block. Thank you very much, Kellogg's. Uh, but what they've got else here is they've actually left the effluent can discharge at its maximum flow rate. This is this is absolute worst case scenario. Simple, but it works. So now I come to um, a, a new one. Uh, it's, a, it's a green call, which is a, an interesting one because it's common now to lots of businesses. Water companies are trying to ask businesses to look at their um, environment and what they're discharging. So they're asking them to put more and more effluent treatment processes on site. They don't want raw sewage or just pH balanced sewage going down to the sewage system. They want it to be treated charging so what you've got here is a lot of businesses are trying to put uh, install uh, effluent treatment processes it's got its benefits because it means that they don't get so many issues and they've got control of what they're putting out control of their costs if they've got a good effluent treatment plant so the situation is installation of a bro's effluent treatment plant so you're going to ask for a permit by uh, variation so you've got to satisfy the regulator to obtain that permit that what you've designed and what you're going to do is going to control and manage any significant event loss of a bulk storage tank 80 cubes for instance on this site here can you contain it if we have an incident and it's raining at the same time where will it go so what we've done and this is something that anybody can do if you just take the right approach you've got to know the drainage so you've got to do a full drainage survey site did have a full site drainage survey what we needed to do was just make sure that what we've got in front of us was correct because if we've missed um, an out point where we've got actually a flow going out and we don't control that the whole design, everything we're doing is a complete waste of time. So what we're looking at is it might just be that we lose a, a cube of some acid that we're delivering. So let's make a drainage system that we can isolate that drainage in under 10 seconds at any time to contain that minor spill. Then we look at the site topography, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And that basically is looking at the site to actually evidence that we can actually contain it. Where does it run? Once we've flooded the drains, where does it all go? Then we look at the bulk storage volume. On this site, it was actually 80 cubes. but then the documentation which is in the Syria guide the one in 10 year rainfall event on that platform using the magic maps to give us the area so it's done as a desktop exercise as well that gives us a volume of liquid that allows us then to say right now build our model through micro drainage um and we identified the correct point to fit the vowels necessarily to isolate the drainage so this is a project that we did with a, a company called MEC which has been really helpful helped us a lot on this so what you've got here is you've got the site other model now if you remember me talking about syria we talk about this 24-hour event what we've done on this site we've actually come to a 12-hour event um <clears throat> it's deemed actually at 12 hours that this site will have control in other words they'll have a response team on site tankers on site actually removing any effluent any spillages the effluent treatment plant actually sits here and our valve the actual isolation of the surface water sits here so what happens is once that surface water is closed off the back flow is all you can see this front end a real action to be taken in this area at all that fills up and actually floods out into the storm drains which is back into like a loading bay area and this is where the depth is you can see the boundary of the site there where my arrow is and you can also see at the back corner there there's a point where the drainage can't get out and we get a high rise there those areas there as you see there in the yellow 0.6 meter depth probably moved it up to 0.7 
the rest of it, the blue and the red, was actually already covered by the wall. All you had to do, all the site had to do, the depth. We're not looking here about much of a, a, a bun, so we're looking at this shock loading. This would be a steady fill up, a slow steady fill up as it started to feed. And this is the exceedance point where we're getting to 182 cubes. We're well beyond what a, a, a reasonable event on that site would look like. That was then submitted to the Environment Agency, and I think all agreed that that was a sensible option. Very little really was spent in that because the money is, needs to be spent on the effluent treatment plant. What you've got here, you've got a toggle block isolation and you've done some uh, minor bunding there and you've done some tertiary minor bunding there to build up that corner. These are the points, obviously, where it builds up. So it's basically like a wall, as anybody knows, topography. So these are the points we had to uh, um, clarify. Job done. Simple, because what you're using is what's already there. You're not altering much. You're not investing a great deal. So another one that we're working on, actually quite quite um, current at the moment, is a situation. So we've got so they are actually, which is quite common, which is starting. So people actually looking to buy a new location and they need to understand the viability of the site for development. So they're looking at a shed. Um, so they're looking at a place that's already been built, probably been already used for something else. Can they change its use, which again is going to be a, a permit uh, change? Can they actually look at that site and say, well, the cost that site's brilliant we can we can rent it for x but how much work do we need to do to look at the containment side of it because we're going to get asked by the ea to refer to syria and look at firewater pollution containment and and obviously we've worked with stericycle before on a number of sites so they've kind of got it so what they're looking at now is instead of going yeah that's a great site they're looking at us and going right before we can uh, invest in a site let's see whether actually it can be built and do what we want it to do um so what we're looking at is challenges understand the current level of water pollution control without any current site activity. So really what we're trying to say is the site is currently closed. Can it do what actually, or is there quite a lot of investment to be done, design investment, which is probably going to eat up some capital, which probably be better to find a different location that may already have been taken into account. I just want to pop over onto this one. We, I remember doing a, a recent project with um, with um, Jaguar Land Rover, who bought a old, well, a brand new warehouse from Winvic, but nobody had considered firewater containment in building the the, the Winvic shed. So they'd put the the siphonic drainage was connected straight to the surface water drainage. Land Rover move in, of course, the EA are asking them to have um, firewater containment as part of their permit, but because the drainage hasn't been designed to work that way, it's not easy. Uh, it's a challenge because then what you've got to do is you've got to reinvest. I think quite a lot of money was spent on actually redesigning a lot of the drainage network. Important point is understand how it works first before you dive in, because if something's been built and not designed as a manufacturing site or not designed with firewater containment in mind, you could end up with it. I think what we'd like to see is anybody building a shed actually does this as part of their design because once it's done, it's done. Um, so what we've done is drainage survey of, of the site and an accurate connectivity plan. So we want to know where the drains go. Topography of the site. Then we've got a spill assessment and model and CAD. So what you've got here is perfect little drainage drawing. It's not a big site. Perfect drainage information. It's telling us what we need to know. The actual drain here, which is on this drawing, I've not completed. Uh, that we've got a, a run of the drain running out out the site into the street so logically what we're looking at is we need to fit a containment valve in this point here depending on how the topography works and the flooding works you can see we've got the, the points coming back so the logical point is to fit a valve on the out point here that blocks the drains so that's going to give us most pollution will be contained I, I can't remember the exact figure but i think it's something about 70 cubes is contained within the drainage network that's quite a lot of of control so this site without doing any to the drainage network has now got a reasonable amount of containment this is kind of the site now as a as a CAD image, so an image of what it looks like. What you can see here is there was no wall here. They're going to need to build um, a wall. They're going to need to build a wall on here to actually do it. There's the driveway in. The driveway in obviously is the point where we will we will potentially is our lowest point. So what we may have to do is put a tabletop onto there. But remember, tabletops with sport lifts and some vehicles can cause issues. So this will be put into that if this site is suitable for what's required and if the EA are saying, right, OK, because of what it is, we want to have a 24 hour firewater containment plan. They're going to need to build, obviously, some significant structure around the site. By doing that, obviously, there's a cost and that cost now could be looked at before going any further into the actual build. 
Right, I'm just coming to the end now. I've got a couple of slides to go. So toggle block, don't slow flow, stop flow. The idea of toggle block is to stop flow in the event of emergency. It's not a flow control device, it's to stop flow. You can see here a couple of installations. This is an installation, well, one installation that we've recently done for Toyota. Um, what you've got there is the control panel, solar, so it's always online. It's not, it's not off, waiting for mains power, etc. Simple little plate you can see in there, which was loaded into on a, on a head wall, and we built up a valve. That sits there on the outlet side. In the event of an incident, this drops, bang, stops the flow. Yes, it's not that easy to open these bores to actually allow water through, so they actually do allow drain flow, and then they can be reset. But the idea of these systems are they are there for that catastrophic failure, for testing, but catastrophic failure, Syria 736 asks you to evidence that the system works. The one thing we do know about our valves is when you close them, they do stop the flow. And that's what they're intended to do. Anything else is really, uh, you should have an action plan. It's all there in the guidance using what you've got. So this is really taking the point of be careful that you haven't got a site that's got, oh, we've got some pen stop. Make sure that they actually stop the flow and make sure that if they're saying, oh, we have to walk down the site to operate the valves, who's going to do that? Who's going to lift the manhole cover? How can that be done in the event of an incident? There's quite a few sites we go to that use this as their, their scheme, a manhole, got to lift it. That's a two-man lift. It's in the mid corner of the yard, yet your site's on fire. So not really very thought about, does the system actually work? And that's what the Syria bit 3.8 is all about. It's not on about you've got to buy the perfect valve. Does the design you've put in place actually work? Can you operate it? So today's sort of talk was more about the assets that are already there because there's a lot of pieces of kit in there. So I've got curbing, tabletops, car parks. They're always there for the attenuation. Great, because most sites now are enforced to fit attenuation uh, tanks. So part of it is we have got a site that we've got, which is a waste site with a 250 cube um, attenuation tank. That's made slightly bigger because what calculated in the storm and the firewater event at the same time. So what they do is they increase the size of that. So they've got actually below ground storage. So there is no real uh, demand on the above ground area because it's the drainage is stopped we block up and fill the attenuation the attenuation was built bigger to take that extra capacity set out in the guidance so you know on new sites sometimes with the assets if you're going to be building up digging a hole anyway can you dig it a little bit bigger or a little bit um greater area to give you the capacity to cover the problem areas obviously they're always there loading bay is perfect because these are the points we were actually at a site the other day um, where the loading bay is actually being flooded because Again, somebody has put a valve system in and made the decision to close the drainage permanently. So the drainage is always closed. What this do has done, in, in my view, is now surcharge the drainage. So the drainage is always full. They monitor the pH then of that water. The pH is not balancing, probably because you're holding stagnant water. A problem for flooding. But my bigger concern, probably not being a civil engineer uh, uh, for that side of it, if I'm forcing drainage to be constantly flooded, I'm potentially pushing water away. It's finding another route off site and potentially undermining my foundations. So sometimes when you take this approach of a pollution containment system, you've got to have the right approach and take a, a, a you know, think about what you're doing, because if you get it wrong, it's not going to work. Now, I've got here the, the bottom picture here. This is one of the pictures out there. Yeah, the red valve is actually a valve. I always say I built it in my shed. You can see one of our Samfield clamps on there. That is actually a retrofit because the original uh, device didn't didn't hold very well. This was the penstock valve that the site had put in, in place. This is PPG Paints up in um, in, in Leeds Way. Um, and what happened was they realised when they closed that valve, it never stopped. This is a seven hundred thousand pound car park, so it's an asset they've built in in a development. The assets are only any good though if the actually work so when they originally went in that didn't stop the flow so this is a retrofit this is the first ever um, toggle block valve that we sort of ever developed um, it's a bit of a Heath Robinson design really because it was nothing was available I had to make something out, out of my own head and that's what it is now that valve there allows this area to flood design works really good really simple gully pots oil separators we do get a lot of sites that talk about oil separators oil separators water they don't offer you much containment capacity very limited amount if you actually do overflow them the oil is going to come out the top potentially out of the turrets so really when you've got oil separators great for monitoring that you've got oil so monitoring that you've got an oil issue so you can actually set your probes where uh, we currently use a lot of uh, euro gauge probes 
nice and simple capacitance, sit it in the top. If we see then a change, that could alarm our valves to shut, which is quite common for us to do, but also allows the site to say, well, we've had a spillage because that's a uh, gully pots. Really important one because I see a lot about plastics in the news and, 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 and stuff in the, in, the, in the environment. These are one of your first environmental responses. They contain hydrocarbons. They will contain rubbish. They will contain leaves, the detritus that actually can cause you problems and sediment. What happens is, or what we believe happens is, years ago, they used to put filters in them. The filters used to get left, so they block up. So we got rid of we design them now as a gully pot. So what you've got here in this, this is, I, I, I'm probably telling people who know, the water comes in, the water sits at this level here. You can see the point there. So that's your level there of that, sorry, of that point there. That's your water level. That's your natural water level. That's where all your bits of rubbish, your cigarette ends, your plastic, your hydrocarbons, they're going to float there. At the bottom, anything heavy, it's going to drop to the bottom. Clean water, crystal clear water will flow there from out of there or from out of there when it rains. What happens is, stand or councils people with uh, gully suckers who don't know what they're doing they suck the top stopper out once you've took that taken that top stopper out what happens is when you get heavy rainfall obviously the gully pot fills up gets quite high as soon as that level reaches that point there everything that was contained wears over it literally wears down the route it doesn't come back through it just wears back over the oil allows itself the paper the rubbish the cigarette ends end up wearing it over it's Again, if you've got a site, because often people look at these, put drain mats over them when they've got pollution, think about it. If you cover one over, will the water just run to the next one, to the next one, to the next one? Just think about how these things are connected and how they're supposed to work. And if you've got any of these assets, check them. Make sure that stopper's in place. Make sure they're not silted up past this point here so they can't actually work anywhere. So that's done today. I hope it was interesting. Uh, obviously, there is a little book that I've got. Can always get in touch with me there's my email you can always contact me what i've done here is is we're, you know we're, we've put three case studies on there are loads that we get involved with we're working on lots of sites i'm not trying to shout about who we work for that's not my intention what i'm trying to say is that there's really good companies out there making a massive effort to understand pollution and they're actually doing it now and they're actually putting a process in place and i i like to believe that's come from the syria guide that's actually allowed them to actually get some evidence to put for listening um hopefully see you all on the on the next one david 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 before you rush off we've had a question okay okay so the question is on the slide with the three bullets for containment volume calculations yeah do calculations need to assume that all three bullet points could simultaneously or consecutively occur i.e rather well, than your volume based on the worst of three based on the assumption that it might be unlikely for them all to incur to occur consecutively in a relatively short period of time right okay i can answer that when we sat writing the guidance so when we sat having our meetings we we had lots of discussions about this now it's open to how you want to do it the the approach that we use is worst case scenario so we look at the one in ten we look at loss of of your materials not you know of, of obviously your bulk materials what do you think you're going to lose? Because what potentially could lose catastrophic failure? It could be the total loss of stock. It, it makes you start to think about how you store your stock, in other words. So if you've got three buildings and you build, you put one building with everything in it, it might make you think, well, actually, we need to store areas and put gaps. This is where uh, getting somebody like David Hanlon involved in fire. So then we're also looking at what the fire brigade chuck at it as well. This does give you a massive amount of liquid and it can be quite scary. But from those animations, and it probably, I don't know who's put that in, but, you know, please get in touch with me. From those animations, looking at is worst case scenario. But then we can draw it back because what you can argue is that isn't potentially realistic to us. I think if you just saw the one that I did at uh, um, Green Corps, we did a 24-hour model. We were, we were containing something like, oh, it was huge, 300 300 cubes or so. It's mad, three, three, 300,000. It was a massive figure. I can't remember the figure now. We tuned it back because the EA accepted at the time with, with the client. Well, actually, you by then because you've only got 80 cubes of effluent to lose and the rainstorm event. So actually, it would be managed. The whole event would be managed because what they were doing, they were backing it up with a drainage contractor who had guaranteed to be on site within four hours with 36,000 litre tankers removing, removing the materials. 
So uh, my answer really is think of it as worst case scenario and then you can detune it back by knowing what your worst case scenario is and where you sit at what time you lose control. So in other words, if you run and after eight hours you lose control, you could you've got evidence to say that is actually quite reasonable because within eight hours we would we would expect to have the fire out. We would expect to have things under control. We'd expect to have probably an environmental team on site actually clearing up. So the worst case scenario gives you the problem, then engineer it backwards. Don't take that as, oh, we can't we can't control that. So it's just a complete give up. It's actually that gives you that gives you a line in the sand to sort of say, well, if we could control that. Well, everything's sorted. We, we've got control. Of it. We did do a site for Barry Calibri, a chocolate factory. We modeled it uh, with MEC. We did run the model. We put two valves, obviously, to drop the drainage. We, so we obviously um, animated those to show that we could drop the drains and they could contain everything. So so they didn't have to do anything other than put two valves in. That was it. That was the whole project. So I hope that answers it. But, you know, if you want to drop me a line, I could send you some sort of some of the reports, ideas that we've used. OK. Cool. Excellent work, David. Well done. Really interesting and useful, I think, as always. Um, just to remind everyone who's still with us, you will receive a uh, feedback form tomorrow if you could take two minutes to complete that that would be really useful for us um, we will also be posting this on our blog that will happen two weeks today you'll be notified when that happens and please feel free to share it if you think there are people in your business who might benefit from that i think this was your best so far david well done man oh, cheers thank you <laughs> anybody's got any ideas let me know because um, we do lots of sites uh, but if anybody wants to qu ask a question about this, you know, please do. Please phone us up or email me. It, 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 it's not, it's not, you're not going to get a hard sell. You're just going to get um, facts, to be honest.